Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOC course on Economics of Health and Education. In this week, let us study about inequalities in health and education. Now, we have already seen that people are born with a certain stock of health or health capital and over a period of time there are there is depreciation that takes place uh, in health conditions. We have also seen that uh, people uh, pursue uh, different kinds of education to be able to gain human capital. Now, in the pursuit of uh, different kinds of achievements, uh, there is uh, always a desire to have equality of outcomes in the context of health and education, uh, levels of living uh, or standards of living, earnings, incomes and so on. But often we experience, uh, while we are pursuing equality of outcomes, often we experience various kinds of inequalities. And the study of inequalities in health and education outcomes forms one of the central themes in the study of health and education. So, in this week, we will focus on some of the important aspects surrounding the discussions on inequalities in health and education. But to begin with, in the first lesson of this week, we will uh, try to understand what are some of the uh, theoretical discussions surrounding inequality. Now, when I say theoretical discussions, I do not intend to go into uh, the um, uh, mathematical formulations of what are uh, inequality uh, indices or I do not want to enter into a discussion on how inequality is to be measured and so on. But there needs to be a conceptual framework that helps us to understand inequalities in health and education. So, in that sense, I want to uh, familiarize the learners about a few uh, theorists uh, in the field of education and health whose uh, conceptual understandings with regard to inequalities have helped us to um, frame a lot of ideas surrounding uh, these issues. So, in this class, I intend to uh, dwell upon three important uh, uh, ideas, if I may. First is Amartya Sen's ideas on equality of what? Sen's life work has focused a lot on uh, inequalities and there are a lot of writings by Sen that has forced us to have a relook at the issue of uh, income poverty uh, where uh, he has brought in the idea of capabilities and functionings and so on. And therefore, it is appropriate that in the context of economics of health and education, we also make an attempt to understand what Sen uh, meant to say in the context of uh, Inequality Re-examined, a book which was published in the early 1990s and has given us a handle to uh, sort of understand how inequality needs to be examined uh, in the context of uh, socio-economic conditions and the book was very appropriately titled as Inequality Re-examined. In the second part of today's lesson, I would uh, want to focus on uh, a renowned economist, a Nobel Prize winning economist, James Heckman, whose work is also highly cited in the context of labor economics, health and education economics. And I will draw upon uh, one of his work, uh, which helps us to discuss the uh, issue of inequality in education and how, uh, what are the policy implications of trying to understand the inequalities in the context of certain life conditions and how investments on education can lead to better outcomes. And then finally, I will take the example of inequality of earnings, which is one of the prime examples that is taken in the context of uh, both health, education as well as the labor market to understand the difference between outcome indicators and process indicators or in the context of how I have titled this lesson as inequalities of outcomes and opportunities. So, with this introduction, let us begin uh, today's uh, lesson. Now, Sen talks about uh, uh, two types of diversities. Uh, he talks about the idea of equality as being confronted by two types of diversities. He says that there is a basic heterogeneity of human beings or there are human beings are intrinsically different from each other, which means that there is a basic heterogeneity of human beings. And the second point is that there is a multiplicity of variables in terms of which equality can be judged. So, human beings are born with different characteristics, with different physical traits, 
different socio-economic conditions and so on. But at the same time, uh, different kinds of variables can be used in terms of which equality, the idea of equality can be judged. So, this heterogeneity among people leads to differences in assessments of equality based on multiple variables and therefore, it begs us the question equality of what? When we uh, say that we want to pursue equality in terms of uh, education or health or we uh, tend to idealize a form of equal society, often it is important to ask uh, equality of what? So, in the introduction to his book on inequality re-examined, he thematizes various concepts that are used which is uh, running across the uh, book and uh, I have uh, harped upon a few of the concepts from the introduction of this book on inequality re-examined and I would also encourage the learners to, um, to have a look at the book uh, titled inequality re-examined. So, he talks about diverse humanity. He says that human beings are diverse as we differ from each other in terms of external characteristics. For example, inherited wealth, the natural and social environment in which we live. Also, we are different in terms of our personal characteristics. For example, our age, our gender, our uh, physical health condition, our susceptibility to illnesses, physical and mental abilities. In the context of human capital theory, we have taken the example of unobserved abilities or unobserved variables in the context of human beings and this is something that we will also discuss uh, today. So, when we claim that we assess equality of outcomes and of opportunity, we have to consider the existence of such human diversities. Now, Sen informs us in his book that often we take the rhetoric of all men are equal or all men are born equal. We often say that human beings are born equal or human beings are equal and this is what we uh, take to mean as what egalitarianism is. But he says that uh, we tend to do this, we tend to buy into this rhetoric of all men are born equal without taking into consideration the human diversities of birth and social surroundings. So, he says that when we are ignoring these interpersonal variations of human beings that can lead to inegalitarianism. Why? Because this hides or ignores the fact that to be able to treat equally or be egalitarian might require unequal treatment of those who are in the disadvantaged group. So, when we say that we are born equal, this might not really lead to egalitarianism in the real sense of the term because although we may be born as human beings, but we may be born into uh, different socio-economic conditions, into different uh, uh, social conditions which may ultimately impact our life conditions as well as the outcomes that we achieve in our life. So, this is where he says that we tend to buy into the rhetoric of all men are equal or all men are born equal and this is what we refer to as egalitarianism, but we ignore the consideration of human diversities of birth and social surroundings and when we ignore this, this may lead to inegalitarianism because this hides the fact that if we have to treat equally or if we have to pursue equal outcomes, we might have to provide unequal treatment to those who have been historically disadvantaged, let us say for example, or who are currently disadvantaged because of various reasons. So, in this context, uh, he uh, uses the term diversity of focus referring to a focal variable. When we say diversities of human conditions, often in our assessments or our measurements about inequality, we take a certain variable, there is one variable of interest. For example, income is often an important variable of interest in economics. So, he says that when we are looking at diversity of focus or a focal variable, uh, that is something that uh, sort of distinguishes uh, different lenses of looking at things. So, equality is judged by comparing one particular aspect of a person, let us say income, with the same aspect of another person. So, then in that case, the choice of which variable is used for comparison becomes the focal variable in the study that we are undertaking. So, then this variable on which the analysis focuses is used to compare different people or different groups of uh, persons. But then he says that while we uh, invest ourselves in uh, trying to look at the focal variable or what is the focus point or the focus variable, we also need to keep in mind that the focal variable may have many internal pluralities, meaning 
that the variable in question may involve a combination of freedoms and achievements. Let us understand this term internal pluralities a little more. So, the concept of internal pluralities of a focal variable basically refers to the idea that if a single variable or measure can encompass multiple dimensions or aspects which are internally diverse and this concept is often discussed in the context of sense works on capabilities and uh, functionings. So, focal variable here is the main variable or measure which is being concerned and in sense work this focal variable often refers to key variables like capabilities, functionings or other indicators of well-being and development because sense life work has been to not underestimate the importance of income in people's lives, but to show that the capacity, the capability to perform, the capability to achieve various functionings should hold center space in terms of what we consider is freedom. So, this is how we understand focal variable. But internal pluralities refers to the fact that within this single focal variable there can be multiple diverse components or dimensions. For example, if the focus variable is capability, it can include various aspects of what a person can do or be such as the capability to be healthy, educated or participate in community life and each of these capabilities represents a different dimension within the broader concept of capability. I might want to take another example also. Let us say the focal variable is income. Now, two persons or two groups of individuals may have very similar levels of income, but the social conditions from within which these uh, two individuals or two groups of persons are uh, functioning in their lives may be entirely different. Some of the very simple examples that we can think of is let us say similar levels of income in two different locations, a remote location and a, a location in the city. We can also think of uh, uh, similar levels of income among two different races, two different castes of population or two different religions of population. We can think about uh, similar levels of income in a, a, a disaster prone area, in a non-disaster prone area. So, there are multiple diversities or there are multiple pluralities which Sen is referring to as internal pluralities in the context of a focal variable that needs to be kept in mind. So, Sen argues that when evaluating well-being or development, it is important to recognize the internal pluralities of focal variable. Often we tend to overemphasize the importance of a focal variable like let us say the income uh, indicator which has been overemphasized in measurement of life conditions, particularly in the context of economics. So, he says that it is important to recognize the internal pluralities of local variables and this means understanding that a single measure or indicator can have multiple components that need to be considered to get a full picture of the concept being measured. And this approach basically challenges the more traditional one dimensional measures of well being such as income or GDP by highlighting the multifaceted nature of human life and the various capabilities that contribute to it. In the context of these uh, human diversities, Sen also talks about the links between the different focal variables or the links between the different spaces. So, for example, if a focal variable is GDP in one context. And if we take another focal variable, let us say access to education and if we must also understand that there are links or disharmonies between uh, these two uh, focal variables. Uh, we have seen many examples uh, where uh, the levels of education uh, may be very high, let us say in a certain country, but the average levels of income may not be uh, very uh, high. Uh, whereas, uh, income levels may be very high due to concentration of income among a few wealthy individuals, but the average levels of education in a country may be very low. So, this is an example of how there may be disharmonies between two focal variables or two different spaces which Sen is referring to in the context of links and disharmonies. So, unequal characteristics such as income, wealth, happiness, etc. can diverge from each other due to diversity among people or heterogeneity among people and equality in terms of one variable need not necessarily coincide with equality in scale of another. So, often we have seen that equal opportunities can lead to very unequal outcomes. For example, there may be equal incomes but very unequal wealth endowments. Uh, similarly, there may be equal wealth but unequal happiness and so on. 
So there may be inequality in different spaces for the same human being which leads us to address the issue of diversity of focus in equality assessments. And these are some of the uh, theories or literature which has gone on to inform and explain why today we have multiple measures of assessments such as the multidimensional poverty index, why we have moved from single measures of income poverty to different methods of assessing deprivation and that has provided us a new lens at uh, looking at uh, uh, vulnerable conditions or deprivation conditions among people. He also talks about uh, in this context diverse egalitarianism taking reference to major ethical theories of social arrangements that assess equity based on some focal variables. So, for example, if you read the introduction to his book, you would see that he has taken reference to various philosophers such as Robert Nozick, for example, who has used the concept of libertarianism uh, to understand uh, egalitarianism uh, in a society. Uh, how liberty is distributed or various kinds of liberties among people are distributed uh, has been used to understand uh, free society or used to understand an egalitarian society. So, in this context Sen argues that often the focal variables selected are different from one theory to another. So, for example, the capabilities approach of Sen focuses on the use of functionings and uh, freedoms or the opportunities of achieving these functionings as the focal variable. Uh, Robert Nozick uses the concept of liberties. There are many studies in economics that have used uh, incomes as the uh, focal variable to be able to assess um, uh, their uh, state of being. So, as I said that income is one of the focal variables that is uh, extensively used in economics, but there are also studies that reject income as the focal variable and tend to focus on other variables let us say assets. So, there are diverse egalitarianism when uh, the focal variable changes depending upon which uh, theory of social arrangement considers which focal variable to be important. Sen also talks about uh, the concepts of achievement and freedom to achieve and I think these two concepts are closely related to the idea of outcomes and opportunities. Uh, if we have to think in terms of a conceptual framework as to how we want to explain the different uh, kinds of uh, uh, results in the context of outcomes and opportunities, uh, Sen's ideas on achievement and freedom to achieve can be used as a conceptual framework. So, what do we mean here? Achievements basically refer to the actual outcomes or states of being that individuals accomplish. These are the realized functioning such as being healthy, being educated, having a job, etc. And achievements are concerned with what people actually do or become. It is about the concrete accomplishments in various aspects of life. But when we talk about freedom to achieve, it refers to the real opportunities or capabilities that individuals have to accomplish those various functionings and it is about the genuine ability to choose among different ways of living. So, this concept emphasizes the range of options available to individuals and their ability to choose among them and it reflects the substantive freedoms people have to pursue different kinds of lives that have reason to value. So, on the one hand we have achievements which means the different kinds of outcomes that we see in our daily lives, someone's uh, levels of earnings, someone's levels of health, someone's levels of education, someone's levels of uh, communication skills let us say. But then if we go, if we step back and look at the various processes that have contributed to these achievements, whether or not the individual concerned who is, uh, who, who is showing these achievements has had the freedom to achieve these or not refers to the opportunity aspect or the process aspect of, uh, of having these achievements. So, let us now understand what are the key distinctions between these two concepts of uh, achievements often Sen also refers to, to them as achieved functionings versus the opportunities or freedom to achieve uh, objective. So, with respect to the actual versus potential, achievement is about what has actually been realized or the actual functionings whereas freedom to achieve is about the potential or capability to realize these functionings. Whether or not I am capable to 
achieve the uh, uh, functionings or not. I have in the earlier uh, classes taken the example of the bicycle where uh, learning, uh, learning to ride a bicycle is an achieved functioning but whether or not I have the ability to learn the um, uh, cycle, bicycle uh, tells me whether I have uh, freedom to, uh, to, uh, uh, to have the achieved functioning or not. I can even go to the extent of saying that uh, there are various kinds of gender disparities in various locations where uh, for example, females are not allowed to ride a uh, bicycle. So, if you do not have the freedom to able to try your hands on a bicycle, then probably you will not be able to achieve the functioning of actually riding a bicycle which may give you utility in the long run. So, this is, this is an example of how we can try to understand this difference between achieved functioning and the freedom to achieve the functioning. Because these, uh, the, the distinction between achieved functionings and the freedom to achieve the functionings translates into what is called outcome versus opportunity. Achievements then are the outcomes that we can observe, whereas freedom uh, refers to the opportunities and choices available to individuals that help us to achieve these outcomes. And in sense, we use both achievements and freedoms to achieve are important for evaluating well-being of an individual. Uh, however, he places particular emphasis on freedoms because they capture the real opportunities people have rather than just the outcomes they achieve. In the context of health and education, we can take some very simple illustrations. In the context of health, achievement could refer to status of health or being in good health. And the freedom to achieve could refer to having access to health care, nutritious food and a healthy living environment that allows one to be in good health. In the context of education, having a certain level of education or degree is achievement, but whether I have access to education institutions or not, whether I have the financial support and whether I have a conducive environment that supports learning or enables me to attain education can be referred to as the freedom to achieve. So, both of these things are important, but often we tend to focus a lot on the outcomes or the achievement aspect without understanding the process aspect or the opportunity aspect of achieving these functionings which is where a uh, sense ideas makes the focal point or the focal variable if, I, if, if we can uh, that as uh, the process aspect or the uh, freedom uh, to achieve aspect uh, with respect to uh, equality of opportunities. Now, <coughs> So, in the first part, we have uh, seen that uh, Sen talks about uh, diversities, human diversities and while talking about human diversities, he makes this very critical distinction between outcomes and opportunities by saying that outcomes can refer to different kinds of functionings or achievements uh, based upon uh, whatever we have access to. But how we have come about those outcomes, how we have achieved those outcomes depends upon the freedom to achieve. And he says that when we are evaluating well-being or when we are evaluating how equal a society is, we need to put emphasis on both the outcomes and the um, opportunities uh, that exist. And in his uh, uh, view of things, uh, uh, his theorization of uh, how equality of what? He refers to putting emphasis more on the process aspect or the opportunity aspect of equality. And it is in this context that we often talk about equality of opportunities. When we talk of public policies or various kinds of programs, we tend to understand whether we are talking only about equality of outcomes or we want we have provided equality of opportunities or every human being in this society has had equal opportunities or not and how those equal opportunities are ultimately put to is a different uh, is a is a different context altogether now in this second part of uh, today's lesson i want to draw your attention to uh, uh, to some of the works by uh, by the economist james heckman who has extensive uh, research in the context of investing in early childhood education and uh, through uh, some of the examples based upon his work also, we can try to understand inequality in outcomes and opportunities. So, um, Heckman has basically in various contexts argued that investing in early childhood education is not just a moral imperative but also an economic one. 
and equalizing educational opportunities and achievements can significantly increase the productivity and economic efficiency of workforce. Today, there is a lot of emphasis on uh, early childhood education, nutrition, health and so on and the um, investments that are made on early childhood uh, education, nutrition has uh, been uh, in place over the period of last 30 or 40 years. But there are economists who have uh, pioneered the field of uh, theorizing as to why this was important and it is in that context that we need to study some of these works. So, Heckman focused on three main questions. Uh, he refers to the question of what does, uh, when does inequality start? We know that there is inequality um, without reference to uh, historical inequalities or historical discrimination such as the caste system in India or historical discrimination such as racism in the US and in many other parts of the world. He refers to short run period when we are talking about families that there are different uh, uh, conditions within which families grow and there are different conditions within which families evolve. He asks the question about when does inequality start in terms of a life cycle hypothesis. Then he asks is it worthwhile to reduce inequality by investing in education. In other words it means is education a pathway to reducing inequality in the long run. And then he asks how best to invest limited resources to create more productive human capital. So, which means that if education is indeed the pathway to reduce um, inequalities in the long run, then what are the best ways that we can carry out investments uh, to create more productive human capital. So, the, to the question about uh, when does inequality start, he highlights on the idea of skill formation and early inequalities. He says that inequality begins early in childhood and that early experiences significantly shape an individual's future abilities, achievements, health and success. And he emphasizes the importance of both cognitive and non-cognitive skills such as attentiveness, perseverance and sociability in driving education and life success. So, it is in this context that Heckman focuses on early childhood care education and how the successes that one can have at the very early years of life can lead to long term returns in the later years. So, with respect to uh, should inequality be reduced by investing in education, he says that yes, there should be investments in early childhood education, especially for disadvantaged children, because they can reduce the achievement gap, decrease the need for special education in the later years increase the likelihood of healthier lifestyles which means that there are connections between uh, investing in uh, early childhood uh, care and education and then its interlinkages with uh, health outcomes or healthier lifestyles in the uh, later years. He also talks about the fact that if we are investing in early childhood care education it may lead to lower crimes, reduce overall social costs. And based on a causal study between uh, impact of education investment on schooling outcomes and uh, on earnings, he cites many studies that show that every dollar invested in high quality early childhood education had yielded a 7 to 10 percent annual return, which means that investing in early childhood care is a profitable uh, concern. It is profitable for the society as a whole. So, in that sense investment in ECE or early childhood education can lead to better um, human capital outcomes. He also emphasizes the importance of uh, family environment and its impact on uh, schooling outcomes. He says that family environment plays a crucial role in a child's development and children from socio-economically disadvantaged backgrounds often receive less cognitive and emotional stimulation and high quality early education can help mitigate these disadvantages. He uh, puts emphasis on the role of cognitive and non-cognitive skills because these together predict various life outcomes such as employment, health and economic successes and Heckman notes that non-cognitive skills are often overlooked in the education system which primarily values cognitive achievements such as achievements like reading skills, communication skills, mathematical abilities, critical thinking, information processing and so on. In fact, Heckman in his later years has gone on to uh, do a lot of work 
by uh, looking at these non-observable variables or non-cognitive skills and how it impacts uh, education and earnings in the uh, later years. I will take an example of one of his papers immediately after discussing his role in uh, justifying uh, investments in early uh, childhood education. And then finally, he also discusses the effective investment strategies. He argues that targeted interventions in early childhood education for disadvantaged children is more cost effective than attempting to remediate their problems later on. And he references various school intervention programs like the high scope peri preschool program and the nurse family partnership which have demonstrated long term positive effects on participants lives. Here in this slide I have also given references to the website heckmanequation.org where uh, learners can get more materials on uh, the different experiments that have been carried out based upon Heckman's work and uh, various empirical studies that you can take um, as examples to understand this whole uh, issue of interaction between inequalities and education and its influence or impact on other outcomes uh, such as related to health and labor market and so on. Now, in continuation with Heckman's contribution to the study on inequalities and education, I also want to highlight this paper by Heckman and others which uh, tells us about the causal effects of schooling on health and labor market outcomes. Now, this paper uh, is based upon a model, the two stage Heckman model which has been used in this paper. Um, I will try to simplify this paper to focus on the main findings of the paper and uh, what are the different steps that have been used to understand the main uh, findings of this paper. This paper uses a sequential schooling model. Uh, for an interested learner, I would uh, request that you visit uh, the National Bureau of Economic Research uh, website to get hold of this paper. However, um, interested learners who have more questions about the Heckman model or uh, questions about this paper, you can put those questions on the portal and we will take up these questions. But uh, in this lesson, I want to summarize some of the important findings from this paper because it will help us to understand this difference between inequality of outcomes and opportunities. So, this paper uses the sequential schooling model. This model basically considers multiple schooling levels and dynamic educational choices allowing for the estimation of both direct and indirect benefits of schooling. Uh, he considers cognitive and socio-emotional factors because both cognitive and socio-emotional skills are considered essential in shaping educational choices and their subsequent effects on labor market and health outcomes. He also refers to unobserved heterogeneity because this model accounts for substantial heterogeneity in unobserved variables that influence educational choices and outcomes. And he also talks about continuation values. Uh, basically, the model includes continuation values which represent the benefits of additional schooling opportunities opened up by previous educational choices. Uh, I will spend a little more time on what do these terms unobserved heterogeneity and continuation values mean because this is the interesting part of this paper. This uh, allows us to uh, think as to how these variables can be taken to measure the, the impact that they have on uh, schooling outcomes and ultimately how that impacts health and labor market outcomes. So, with respect to unobserved heterogeneity, we will be able to understand better if we can understand what are the implications of unobserved heterogeneity. Different individuals make different educational choices based on their cognitive or socio-emotional skills. For example, those with higher cognitive skills might be more likely to pursue higher education. And the outcomes of educational attainment such as wages, health and behaviors are influenced by these unobserved factors. So, if I have uh, higher uh, cognitive skills, then I might want to spend more years uh, in education and that will obviously lead to higher returns. I will have higher returns to education. We have discussed that higher education gives rise to higher return, has higher returns to education. And we have also seen that uh, if the expected uh, value of returns is higher, then the demand for education is also higher in the uh, current period. So, people with higher cognitive skills will be more likely to pursue higher education and it will lead to better outcomes in future in the form of educational attainments. 
also wages, health, behavior, social behavior, uh, which are all influenced by these unobserved factors. The model helps to estimate the true causal effects of education by accounting for this variation. Uh, the, in terms of policy design, uh, understanding unobserved heterogeneity is crucial for designing effective educational policies. Policies that enhance both cognitive and social emotional skills can lead to better education and economic outcomes. Uh, now, just to give an illustration, cognitive skills refers to a student with high cognitive skills is more likely to graduate from high school and pursue college. Um, example, a, a student with very high uh, test scores uh, is more likely to graduate from high school and pursue college. Similarly, a student with high socio-emotional skills uh, is more likely to persist in school despite challenges and less likely to engage in risky behaviors. So, and how continuation values work, uh, Heckman uses the term continuous values in his uh, work in this model. Uh, so, let us say that a student takes an initial decision, a uh, student decides whether to graduate from high school. Now, the direct benefit of that initial decision is that the student obtains a high school diploma, uh, which obviously has some job prospects rather than having no uh, diploma at all. But there is a continuation value to this initial decision of the student deciding to uh, graduate from high school. And this continuation value is basically the additional benefit of being able to enroll in college because the student has a high school diploma or has graduated from high school. So, there is a direct benefit of having achieved the uh, diploma, but there is a continuation value because it gives you the ability to enroll in uh, college. So, there is a continuation value to this uh, diploma. Uh, now, once the student has graduated from high school, they have the option to attend college. So, this is what is referred to as future educational choices in Heckman's uh, and others model. So, the direct benefit of college is also there along with continuation value of college. In the context of direct benefit of college, if they choose to attend college, they can gain knowledge, skills and a college degree, which then again directly improves their career prospects and earning potential. But there is a continuation value of college also because the college education itself opens up future opportunities such as the possibility of pursuing advanced degree example a masters or a doctorate leading to even higher potential benefits. So, we have seen what uh, uh, continuation values here referred to which is considered in the model. There are different levels of schooling and how when one is continuing from one level of schooling to another, the choice of continuing from one level of schooling to another has a direct benefit as well as a continuation value and all of these are taken as variables in the model uh, to explain the causal effect of schooling outcomes on um, health and labor market outcomes. So, uh, we can further exemplify these continuation values in action. So, let us say a student graduates from high school. And this decision directly benefits them by qualifying them for better jobs compared to a high school dropout. And uh, this graduation creates the opportunity to attend college. So, the potential benefit of attending college are part of the continuation value of the initial decision to graduate from high school. And similarly, with regard to college enrollment, where the direct benefit is that the uh, student acquires college level knowledge and skills and obtains a degree. And the continuation value is that uh, this decision opens up future education and career opportunities. So, in this empirical analysis, the authors have used the data from the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth 1979 focusing on males in the United States. Now, it is useful to look at the US studies because US of course is one of the advanced countries of the world and uh, if we can uh, try and understand the inequalities uh, that persist in countries such as the US, it will give us uh, uh, direction to also study various kinds of inequalities in the context of other countries. Uh, so, the outcomes that the empirical analysis uh, considers or analyzes includes wages, physical health, smoking behavior and self-esteem and the educational transitions that the model considers are the various educational stages such as high school graduation, obtaining a, a GED test score after high school, uh, college enrollment, college graduation and so on. 
the estimation strategy is in two stages in the first stage it estimate the model estimates the distribution of latent endowments and the model of schooling decisions using maximum likelihood estimation and in the second stage the estimates uh, model estimates the outcome equations using the first stage estimates to control for selection bias and measurement error those who are interested in understanding the heckman model are encouraged to read the paper and also visit the heckmanequation.org website to get more details about this so what are the policy implications of this uh, study this study highlights the importance of considering both cognitive and socio emotional skills in education policies because policies that enhance these skills can have significant long term benefits on health and labor market outcomes uh, these are the main findings of this paper uh, it says that there is significant sorting into schools based on both cognitive and socio emotional factors so which means that uh, students who have uh, shown high cognitive skills or high socio economic skills are more admitted into higher education than otherwise uh, similarly uh, causal effects of education are, are shown uh, uh, to be substantial on smoking physical health and wages across different levels of schooling uh, there are heterogeneity in benefits of education uh, on people with different abilities high ability individuals benefit more from graduating college low ability individuals gain in terms of self esteem and are less likely to enroll themselves into college education importance to continuation values they are a significant component of the causal effects of this education of this model and the uh, paper also highlights that there are significant measurements errors uh, which is a part of the econometric model that is used in this paper that we can ignore for the time being so in terms of heckman's contribution to this field of uh, uh, inequality of outcomes and opportunities we can say that there are there is it is significant uh, it has helped us in significantly advancing the understanding of inequality in education by emphasizing the importance of both cognitive and socio emotional skills in shaping educational and life outcomes and his research demonstrates that early childhood education especially for disadvantaged children yields substantial long term economic and social benefits by closing the achievement gaps and promoting equity heckman's work integrates insights from economics and other disciplines highlighting the role of early interventions in human capital development and advocating for policies that addresses both the immediate and continuation values of education his contributions underscored the necessity of investing in early development to create equal opportunities and improve the overall productivity and social welfare so uh, what we have done uh, in the second part of this lesson is we have introduced uh, to you a conceptual framework again uh, by james heckman which allows us to understand why investments in early childhood care education is important and uh, how the idea of equality of opportunities can be uh, uh, used to uh, to carry out this estimation that shows the causal effect of schooling on uh, the different outcomes uh, outcome indicators such as health and labor markets and it also shows how uh, innate abilities of individuals uh, which he refers to as um, the unobservable variables goes on to uh, inform uh, whether or not uh, individuals take the decision of enrolling themselves in educational institutions or not so in that sense this paper and heckman's work gives us a lot of material to think about and uh, theorize about the uh, impact of inequality on uh, education and how inequality needs to be dealt with to be able to have productive human capital in the society now in the last part of this lesson we will talk about uh, inequality in earnings again to highlight the importance between the inequality of outcomes and opportunities now often we have experienced uh, disparity in earnings disparity in earnings between men and women disparity in earnings uh, between uh, skilled and unskilled labor disparity in earnings between less educated and more educated people and this is what we refer to as inequality of outcomes 
but uh, we also refer to in the context of economics of education and uh, labor, we also refer to intergenerational mobilities, whether or not the uh, um, next generation is um, as worse off as the previous generation or has gained in terms of outcomes is again a very central theme in the context of economics of health education and the labor markets. So, here I will take a few examples in the form of estimates to highlight upon this fact that um, while there is inequality of outcomes, we must also put emphasis on inequality of opportunities to be able to see better outcomes in uh, future. So, if you look at this table here, this table uh, shows us displays the dispersion of uh, gender of earnings by gender for individuals 25 to 64 from 1980 to uh, 2008 expressed in uh, 2008 dollars. And this table uh, shows earnings at the 80th percentile and the 20th percentile for men and women. So, this shows here the 80th percentile and the 20th percentile basically it says that the earnings here in the 80th percentile is more than 80 percent of people in the sample and the earnings score on the 20th percentile is more than 20 percent of the people in the uh, sample. So, you could say that the 20th percentile at the bottom uh, uh, people in the bottom of the hierarchy of the sample and 80th percentile are those who are at the top. Now, if you uh, look at this table some of the uh, key points that can be concluded from the table are as follows. If you look at the column on of earnings at the 80th percentile and if you look at the upper panel which is for uh, men, you will see that for men the earnings at the 80th percentile remained relatively stable between 1980 and uh, 2008. It ranged between approximately 74,000 to about uh, uh, 78,000 with a slight increasing peak in uh, 2005. So, there was a slight increase in the peak in uh, 2005, but more or less it remained stable. But if you look at the lower panel here among women, uh, you will see that uh, the earnings at the 80th percentile increased significantly from 1980 to 2008. It increased from about approximately 39,000 dollars to about 51,000 dollars. Similarly, if you look at those in the 20th percentile, there uh, for men the earnings at the 20th percentile slightly decreased from 1980 to 1990 from 24,000 approximately to 21,000 and uh, then fluctuated slightly up to uh, 2008. For women the earnings at the 20th percentile showed an overall increase from 1980 to 2008. Now, this third column here shows the uh, ratio of uh, earnings at the 80th to the 20th uh, percentile uh, for both men and women. In the case of men, the uh, earnings ratio increased from 3.08 to 3.58 in 2008, which basically shows uh, that there is growing disparity in earnings within the top and uh, bottom percentiles. For women, the ratio peaked in 1990 at uh, 4.6 and decreased slightly by 2008 to 3.87, indicating some fluctuation in earnings disparity over the years. Now, another important aspect of this table is with respect to the gender differences. Uh, in fact, that is very stark. Uh, women's earnings at both the 80th and 20th percentiles were consistently lower than men's throughout the period. And the rate of increase in earnings for women at the 80th percentile was higher than for men, reflecting some progress in reducing the gender pay gap at higher earnings levels. But the earnings disparity within each gender as indicated by the ratios suggests that inequality within genders persisted and sometimes even increased. So, overall this table illustrates the changes in earnings distribution over time highlighting both improvements and ongoing challenges in gender wage disparities. But the gender wage disparities is very stark and it comes out very clearly in the table and uh, it shows that while we are considering earnings as some kind of an achievement, there is increase in earnings which means that there is some kind of an achievement here. But we also have to pay attention to the plurality of this focal variable of earnings which and the plurality here is with respect to your a position uh, in terms of your gender identity influences your uh, levels of earnings or incomes. 
Now, let us look at this uh, second table here. This table displays mean earnings and the returns to education among full time year round workers aged 35 to 44 expressed in 2008 dollars from 1980 to 2008. And this table is divided into earnings for different education levels. You have dropouts, high school graduates, uh, bachelor's degree uh, holders, uh, grad school meaning uh, post graduation and above in the context of US. And then there are corresponding earnings ratios. So, these earnings ratios here this one shows high school uh, versus dropouts, bachelor's versus high school and grad school versus uh, bachelor's. Now, with respect to earnings by education level in the context of men, we see that mean earnings for men increase with higher educational attainment across all the years. So, if you see from dropouts to high school grads to bachelors to graduate school, you will see that the mean earnings for men has increased over the years. Earnings for men with a high school diploma were uh, 53,518 in 1980. Uh, if you look at this figure here, it was 53,000 approx in 1980 and it decreased to 47,000 approximately in 2008. Now, men with a bachelor's degree saw their mean earnings increase from 75,000 approximately to 86,000 in 2008. And men with graduate degree also saw an increase from an approximate figure of 86,000 dollars to 116,000 in 2008. In the context of women, if you see, mean earnings for women also increase with higher education attainment from dropouts to high school grad, bachelors to grad school, there is uh, an increase in earnings. Earnings for women with a high school diploma were approximately uh, 30,000 in 1980 and it has been 30,000 even in 2008. This is in sharp contrast to what we observe in the case of uh, men. Women with a bachelor's degree saw their mean incomes increase, women with grad school degree also saw their uh, mean incomes uh, increase. Now, let us look at the earnings ratio in the case of high school versus dropout. For men, the ratio increased from 1.40 to 1.47 uh, from 1980 to 2008, which indicates a growing earnings gap between high school graduates and dropouts. For women, the ratio also increased from 1.29 to 1.38. In the case of uh, bachelors versus uh, high school, for men, the ratio increased from 1.41 to 1.84. Uh, this indicates a significant increase in the earnings premium for a bachelor's degree over a high school uh, diploma, which means that the uh, returns to education from a bachelor's degree is much higher than that of a high school diploma. For women, you see a much more significant increase from 1.36 in 1980 to uh, 2.02 in 2008. In terms of grad school, for men, the ratio increased from 1.14 to 1.35. For women, it increased from 1.17 to 1.25. Now, some of the general observations that we can draw from this table is that higher education attainment consistently leads to higher mean earnings for both men and women. And the returns to education in terms of earnings have increased over time, particularly for those with bachelor's or uh, graduate degree. And this is something that we have discussed in the context of economics of education that the returns to education is higher for higher education as we have seen in the context of bachelor's and grad degree holders here. The earnings gap between different education levels has also generally widened over the period from 1980 to 2008 and that indicates increasing returns to higher education. Uh, one final point on this table is that women's earnings have grown at a faster rate than men's in certain educational categories, particularly for those with a bachelor's degree. And this is a very interesting uh, uh, change that has happened in the developed world, particularly in the context of the US. that. Um, as more and more women have moved into higher education, their returns to education have increased significantly, their earnings have increased significantly. Apart from earnings, their share in employment has also increased significantly. But uh, there is a contrast in the context of the developing world where we see 
but as more and more women have moved into higher education or despite more and more women moving into higher education their employment share doesn't seem to have improved as much as we have seen in the context of the developed world let us say the united states now let us move to this uh, third table here this table shows the employment shares within gender for different education groups among uh, workers as uh, age 25 and older from 1980 to 2008 and this table is divided into groups uh, whose relative earnings rose and whose relative earnings fell so this is the group whose relative earnings uh, rose and this is the group whose uh, relative earnings uh, fell now if you look at the upper panel which shows the group whose uh, relative earnings rose uh, a which is men with graduate degree you will see that their employment share increased from 9.1% in 1980 to 12% in 2008 uh, b men with bachelor's degree the employment share increased significantly from 11.4% to 21% remember that here we are talking about employment shares within the economy by uh, gender as well as by education attainments between the period 1980 to 2008 if you look at the group c which is uh, in the upper panel women with graduate degree their employment share also increased significantly from 5.7 to 12.7% and women with bachelor's degree increased uh, from 10.3 to 22.8% If you look at the lower panel groups whose relative earnings fell these are men with high school degree fell from 38% to 30% male dropouts 22% to 10% women with high school degree 46% to 27% female dropout 17.8 to 7.2% so what are the key insights from this table here this shows that the employment shares for both men and women with bachelor's and graduate degrees have increased significantly over the years indicating a growing trend towards higher education attainment in the workforce and this trend is consistent across both genders with particularly notable increases for women with bachelor's and graduate degrees this table also shows that there is a decrease in employment shares for lower education groups meaning that employment shares for men and women with only a high school degree or who are dropouts have decreased over time and the most significant declines are seen in the employment shares of women with high school degrees and male dropouts and this has implications for the workforce composition this data suggests that there is a shift towards a more educated workforce with higher education levels becoming more prevalent among workers age 25 and older and this shift is likely driven by the increasing returns to higher education as we have discussed in the case of the previous tables in terms of the gender trends while both men and women have seen increases in employment shares for higher education attainment the increase seems to be more pronounced in the case of women suggesting that women have been making strides significant strides in higher education participation over the past few decades and overall this table also highlights the changing composition of the workforce with a growing emphasis on higher education and the corresponding decline in the share of workers with lower education attainment so this reflects broader economic and social trends emphasizing the importance of higher education for career advancement and earnings potential so from these tables what do we conclude we conclude uh, about uh, inequality of outcomes we have seen that uh, there are inequalities of outcomes with regard to gender and we have also seen that there are inequalities of outcomes with regard to different education levels but apart from the fact that we have seen the existence of inequality of outcomes we have also seen that these uh, outcomes have uh, certain implications for the economy as a whole of course we are discussing in the context of the us economy here but it gives us some uh, direction as to uh, how we can understand these uh, inequality of outcomes i'll finally end this lesson with this uh, uh, empirical study on uh, do parents earning determine the uh, earnings of their children this is based upon an empirical study the reference for which is shown in the end of the slide this is to highlight the importance of intergenerational mobility and that and how that impacts uh, education outcomes 
The analysis of earnings inequality not only focuses on the distribution of earnings at a specific time, but also on the opportunity for children particularly from low income households to improve their economic status compared to their parents and intergenerational mobility is a critical factor in understanding how inequality persists or changes with generations. This is an empirical study based upon the uh, Gary Solon intergenerational income mobility in the United States and by Bhaskar Majumdar on analyzing income mobility over generations. I will quickly try to summarize this empirical study. So here they have considered intergenerational earnings elasticity and to measure intergenerational mobility uh, they have used the elasticity of children's earnings relative to their parents earnings. So, children in the next generation compared to parents earnings in the previous generation and this elasticity indicates the degree to which income advantages or disadvantages are passed from one generation to the next. So, elasticity of one means that earnings inequality is completely inherited and shows no intergenerational mobility, elasticity of zero meaning that there is no correlation between parents and uh, children's earnings indicating high intergenerational mobility. So, there may be bias in estimates which need to be taken care of in these kinds of studies and this study shows that there are uh, intergenerational uh, effects as far as uh, earnings are concerned. Uh, children uh, whose uh, parents uh, had lower incomes uh, also tend to have lower incomes in the future period. So, improved data and longer observation periods have led to higher elasticity estimates suggesting lower upward mobility in the United States and uh, these estimates imply significant persistence of earnings inequality across generations. For example, a 200 percent earnings gap between high and low earning men today might result in a 120 percent earnings gap between their sons 25 to 30 years later assuming other factors remain constant. So, these kinds of intergenerational mobility studies also highlight the fact that generational incomes or generational socioeconomic conditions can impact the achieved functionings or achievements of children in the next generation. So, from this uh, study we can conclude that there is persistence of earnings inequality across uh, generations and it has become more evident as data quality has improved and higher estimated elasticities also suggest that the opportunity for upward mobility even in a country like United States is more limited uh, than was previously thought highlighting the importance of policies aimed at increasing educational and economic opportunities for disadvantaged families. We will end today's lesson here. What we have done in today's lesson is to highlight three important aspects of the discussion surrounding inequalities of outcomes and opportunities. We have taken the help of Amartya Sen's book on inequality re-examined to understand the question of equality of what? When we say equality, uh, whether we are referring to equality of outcomes alone or we are talking about equality of opportunities. From Sen's work, we have seen that he has put focus uh, more on, although he wants, he says that the uh, measurement of equality of outcomes and opportunities both are important. There is more primacy to equality of opportunities or the freedom to um, achieve uh, the functionings is what uh, there should be more focus on. We have also seen some of the important uh, conclusions that uh, James Heckman has talked about in the context of investments in early childhood care and education and how um, the investments in early childhood care and education has been justified to have more productive society in terms of productive human capital and how he has talked about uh, inequalities beginning from the childhood and therefore the focus more on different kinds of investments surrounding childhood conditions. And then finally, I have uh, taken a chapter from one of the labor economics textbooks to understand the difference between inequalities of outcomes and opportunities by focusing on one focal variable and that is inequality in earnings. And we have seen that uh, your uh, locational identity in terms of or your positional identity in terms of your gender or your educational outcomes can impact your future earnings. And then finally, we also saw that intergenerational mobility is more restricted than what we have been thinking so far and uh, we see this uh, even in the context of the United States which is one of the most developed countries of the world that uh, parents education and parents income in the previous generation can severely limit or impact 
uh, returns to education or uh, the income uh, earning capabilities of children in the next generation. So, for this lesson I have used some of these references sense book on uh, inequality re-examined. I would encourage learners to read the chapters on equality of what which is chapter number 1 and the introduction to this book which is uh, which is full of materials that can be utilized for your uh, learning. Uh, the paper uh, by James Heckman, The Economics of Inequality, The Value of Early Childhood Education and a textbook of Modern Labor Economics by um, Ehrenberg, Smith and Hallock and chapter 15 will give you more materials to understand uh, the subject matter of inequality of earnings. So, with this I end this class today. Thank you. Mm -hmm.